you make me a cow host. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the March 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Meet Conservation Commission, there we go. Um, first item on the agenda is comments from the chair, that's me. And I think the most exciting thing we have is a new commissioner. Andre, welcome. Um, just since we all haven't met you, uh, just a quick introduction and we'll introduce ourselves um, just so we all are familiar. <laughs> we spend a lot of time on here together, so I think it's worth three minutes just to say hello. Sure. Uh, my name is Andre Gadera. Um, I'm uh, Let's see, I'm a graduate from Amherst High School, um, moved away for uh, about 35 years or so, and I am uh, spent a career in uh, uh, wildlife protection. I was a park ranger followed by a wildlife inspector at the airports in uh, Chicago O'Hare, and then uh, spent 22 years as a, as a special agent with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I think that... that Mostly sums it up. I, uh, I'm an outdoors person. Um, I've uh, got a, a degree in uh, wildlife biology uh, from UMass. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, giving what I can to, uh, to this commission and to the uh, people of the town. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for being here. We're psyched to have you on board. Commissioners, do we want to just do a brief introduction, maybe your name and why you're on the commission, your motivation? <laughs> uh, Laura, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Hi, Andre. Um, I'm Laura Pagliarulo, obviously. Um, my background is in renewable energy development. So there's a lot of that going around here. My undergraduate degree is in environmental science, but um, my focus in my professional world is on um, solar, wind, and storage projects. Just going in a circle on my screen, Leroy. Uh, I was actually going to last because we're the only ones who have met, I think. But, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> cool, uh, okay. Obviously, my name is Leroy. Nice to see you again. Uh, my background is mostly in trees, and that's that. Uh, Larry? Uh, my background is I'm a retired professor of mechanical engineering from the university. I've lived in Amherst for 53 or four years, so I know the town a little bit, and I'm interested in the environment. My actual specialty area was energy and the environment. Thanks, Larry. Michelle? Hi, um, I'm Michelle. Uh, I also went to Amherst High. I also went to UMass and have a wildlife degree from there and natural, resource, um, natural resources. I work for our land trust as an analyst and we do conservation of endangered species as our, as our main practice. Awesome, thanks Michelle. And I'm Jen, um, I am a hydrologist, a water resource engineer and biogeochemist. Um, I grew up going on conservation commission site walks as a kid um, because in my hometown in Eastern Mass, my dad was a long-term commissioner. So it was something that when my husband and I finally settled was really important to me. I think it's a cool way to give back to the community. So I appreciate you joining us. Um, it's great to have you on board and commissioners, thanks everyone for ongoing commitment to this. Um, I love working with all of you on this. So thanks for the few minutes. Um, aside from that, our agenda is pretty full and uh, just letting you guys know it's gonna get even busier in the coming weeks. We have some big hearings on the docket. Um, so as you can make time and be available, we really appreciate it. Also along those lines, one thing that was on our agenda for tonight is talking about the mission statement. I just didn't get to it this week. Um, so I think we're gonna table it given how full our agenda is, um, unless somebody uh, is really opposed to that. Um, I think we'll save it and try to get to it in the next, the first meeting in April. Is that all right with everyone? 
seeing thumbs up and nods. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I know Dave isn't with us this evening. Um, so I think we'll next go to Aaron or we can just go straight to minutes. Um, but let me just say for the members that we have six attendees from the public right now. Hi, everyone. Um, we're just getting through some other business and then we'll start hearings. Our first hearing is an RDA for 21 East Hadley Road. Then we go to a notice of intent for 80 Pine Street. And finally, the RDA for Zero Tuckerman and Zero Kingman. Um, so we have a pretty full lineup. So bear with us and I'll try to keep you posted on what, what's going on. Um, all right, with that, Erin, should we do some minutes here? Yeah, so I don't actually have any minutes okay. ready for this evening, so that'll make I'm that like, easy. Maybe I missed them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So that one's easy. Um, but if we we could jump into land use applications, um, okay. that would be, I think, a good place to start. Okay. Cool. Um, so the first one we have on the agenda, or we have one on the agenda, but two in the. Yeah, one came in very last minute. Uh, came in like. Day before yesterday. Okay, so do you know, let's start with a Fort River farm. Do you know if Madeline is going to join us? Um, no. I believe she is. That's her, oh, uh, I, I believe her, her hand is raised there. Yep. Okay, Madeline, I'm going to move you in. So we should, should rejoin us as a panelist. Mm -hmm. Oh, Madeline, we see you're here, but I think you're muted. I was just going to ask you to introduce yourself and give us a brief two minute overview of your application. Oh, yes. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, welcome. Okay. Hi, thank you. It's great to hear your intros and thanks for your service. So I am a certified nature therapy guide. And what I'm applying for is to do a two hour workshop on the land at the Fort River Conservation Farm. And it would be a very simple, slow kind of walk around the grounds. You froze up. Melon, we lost you. So, okay. so Madeline, if you can hear us, sometimes if you turn off your video, uh -oh. we lost her. Let's give it a couple of minutes. Um, Switch to stargazing. Well, I want to. Let's just give her a couple of minutes. Did everyone have a second to look at the um, land use application? Yes. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, so Dave Z did have a little bit of just because we're there's no trails on the property and we just did the um, restoration, the Fort River restoration there. He just wanted to kind of um, give a word of caution that, you know, it's not really, um, you know, generally speaking, we sort of like mark the trails and set up a kiosk and get everything ready prior to sort of welcoming the public to come. And it's not that it's closed to the public. It's just that we haven't done any sort of introductory preparation of the site, which is fine. It's mostly just to let her know that and that, you know, um, uh Oh, is Aaron frozen? We're being attacked by the Neverland. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah. Roy, I see you have your hand up. There's a, there's other properties available as well that might. Uh, similar comment, not a problem. Just a, kind of an awareness thing. I, if I'm recalling this correctly, it's up to ten cars parking. She was requesting, so that's fine. But it's first come, first serve. If there's people there, obviously, but she can't have it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <clears throat> Madeline, I see you. I don't know. If okay, you... I'm back. Okay, welcome back. Okay, my apologies. So as a certified nature therapy guide, I'd like to invite about 10 people for a two hour, very gentle walk 
just around the community gardens and in the Walnut Grove. Um, it's a combination uh, event from Mothers Out Front, which is a local climate change activist group, and also with Healthy Hampshire, who actually funded the community garden. That's on Sunday, April 3rd from 2 to 4 p.m. So that's what we're doing and wondering what's next. Okay. Um, yeah, so usually for these land use applications, we just go over things like parking and public access, make sure that it's going to be safe for this size group, um, make sure that the footprint will be minimal. I think um, Aaron was relaying from Dave Zomack that while it is a public site, we haven't established any trails or like a kiosk or anything there yet. And there was just recently a lot of work, restoration work done um, along the Fort River there, which is super exciting. Um, hopefully we're restoring some great aquatic and like riparian habitat, but it's important that like we're really careful about the brand new plantings and, and vegetation uh -huh. and bank stabilization that have gone in there. Um, Leroy also brought up a good point parking for 10 people is going to be tough. Like it's first come, first serve. So um, if there's any way to encourage people to carpool, uh, organize carpools, um, it can just be tricky to get 10 cars in there for one event. Um, mm -hmm. I think those were kind of the two concerns we flagged. Any commissioners, anything else? Any other concerns about this? No, I, I actually, I mean, I love the mission. So um, I don't know when you said when there's no defined trails though, is there, I mean, there's only 10 people. So it's not like it's gonna be a big event. So it's yeah. like people hiking through the woods. So I think it's okay. Yeah, and I just think a strong word of caution, like there's just been a lot of restoration work done there that is hard earned grant money and yes. <laughs> dollars. Um, and we're just really trying to restore the, the creek there, both for water quality and habitat quality. Um, so yes. if there's any way to kind of be really careful about the footprint, mm -hmm. uh, we really appreciate it. Michelle, yes, did you have a Sorry. Um, I was just wondering how easy, is it obvious where that restoration footprint is? I've been there. I love this piece of land. Just so to reassure you, I, I, I'm very tender hearted about this place, which is why I'm doing this beautiful experience so people can connect with the land. It's going to be very sort of, we're barely moving across the land. We're going to sit in a circle of chairs right between the gardens and the walnut grove. And then they'll just, you know, be gently wandering about but I will absolutely, I have a degree from the Conway School of Landscape Design. So I do have a background and feel protective of this place. And that will be part of the lesson is to be aware that this was um, a, a riverine stabilization project and you know that we're guests here. We appreciate that. Yeah, Michelle, I haven't been out there since last fall. So I don't know how obvious it is, um, but it sounds like Madeline has a trained eye. Um, if it made sense, we could share like one of the plan sheets from that project so you can just see the footprint. Um, that's all public information. Um, so if that would make commissioners feel better, we can make sure Madeline gets that info. Um, Thank you for listening. Yeah. Okay. So I think it sounds like we're all with those caveats. I'm happy to approve this application. Erin, do we need a motion? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, so commissioners, I'm looking for a motion to um, approve the land use application for Fort River Farm. I make the motion to approve the application for Fort River Farm. Second. second. I heard Leroy on the second. Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. Um, so we're good. Thank you, Madeline. I hope it's a great event. All right, thanks for your time, everybody. Good night. Good night. Um, all right. The other um, land use application was for stargazing at Mount Pollux. Erin, did we have, do you know if we have anyone joining us? Um, no, we don't. The, this is actually, um, 
uh, a continuation from a previous um, a previous applicant had come forward with us for star approval for stargazing um, events at Mount Pollux, and so this is somebody who previously had approval and is just coming back again this year for another approval. Um, so I'm assuming that we would just sort of approve it under the same um, the same conditions. But it came in very late. It came in I think the day before yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to reach out to them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I took a look at the application. I thought it was thorough and all of our usual concerns were addressed, um, but mainly parking at Mount Pollux. Um, so it sounds like there's only going to be one to two vehicles and they understand that, um, that they should take out anything they bring in. Um, so I think it's a great mission and I have seen no problems approving the permit. Commissioners. Do they need to or somebody need to tell the Amherst police they're they're approved or do they get a windshield or something? Okay. Yeah, they have to contact the police department and tell them that they have a permit from us, um, and then put a, the copy of the permit in their windshield and carry it with them, just in case, so that they know on those specific days that um, they're approved to be there, so that it, the police don't, you know, waste their time going after um, it as a you know, because it's because conservation land is otherwise open only dawn till dusk. Good call, Michelle. All right, I need a motion to approve the land use application for stargazing at Mount Pollux. Uh, Second. Second. Oh, geez. I think Leroy got the motion. Laura got the second. Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Leroy. Uh, Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. That was that. Um, I have 720. Yeah, do you, you guys want to do the emergent the Belchertown Road emergency start, Aaron? That would be great. Um so um, I don't have any photos to share just on hand immediately, but um, actually maybe I can try to pull them up. Um, the, there was a washout on Route 9 um, between Fort River and the Fort River where it goes under um, Belchertown Road and then Stanley Street. Um, there's a little oxbow there and um, the DPW contacted us and con they're in the process of working with Natural Heritage. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. The initial notification of with the washout. Um, sorry, let's get queued up here for you guys. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. So this is showing the washout. It was a failed um, catch basin and they stabilized it with some riprap. It's, it caused a big uh, sinkhole in the road. So um, they're communicating with Natural Heritage to get their sort of after the fact approval for the work that was done to stabilize the roadway and the shoulder. Um, and I, there was no, they were staying, um, out of there was no equipment in the water there was no work in the water um, they worked to keep the riprap um, up along the the slope that goes up to the, the road so i didn't have any issues with it and um, dave granted his approval to issue it so uh, we would just need a um a vote to ratify that emergency certification and i can get the um Sorry, I'm doing a lot of switching around here. Okay, here I can do it. Um, we just need a motion to ratify the emergency certification for Route 9, a um, stabilization of a culvert failure on Route 9 slash Belchertown Road for the Amherst DPW. That moved. We got Michelle. You need a second? Second. Larry's on the second. Voice vote. <laughs> Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Leroy. Aye. 
I'm an I. Fabulous. All right. Um, we still have seven minutes. Aaron, um, any, you let me know what you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just talk about Vista Terrace for a minute. Um, you might recall that um, I really apologize for this drawing. <laughs> um, this is my um, artistic rendition here. No, it's uh, literally something I put together in three minutes just to demonstrate what's going on. You guys might recall that um, at the end of last year, they submitted a request for certificate of compliance out um, at Vista Terrace. And when I went out to do an inspection for the request, um, the site was very unstable. It looked like they had seeded it down basically right as the ground was freezing and then mulched it. And unfortunately, then we got the ground was frozen. We got this huge rainstorm and all the material just washed down. Um, can you guys see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, let me see if I can actually annotate this. So um, there was water kind of flowing in this direction, zigging down like this, that kind of channeled out. And then there's a lot of water coming down from this direction, channeling down. Um, just a lot of gullying in the, um, um, on the site where it was unstable. And so I met with the owner's um, contractor because we're trying to come up with some solution to address the water here because it's, um, you know, we, we need to stabilize it in some way and they need to get their certificate of compliance. So what we had discussed in the field was just putting a very low gradient, very shallow sort of, um, uh, I called it, I call it sort of a rain garden slash just infiltration basin there to hold water temporarily. Um, it would be grass, something that you could just literally drive a lawnmower into to mow with a little um, low gradient spillway that's got like a riprap check dam and then a low gradient grass swale coming down in this direction. So just to capture the water allow it to infiltrate and allow it to move where it wants to go without um, uh, causing the gullying that's forming currently. So they basically asked for permission to do this as a corrective measure to the um, field conditions that are happening right now. And I think that it's, it's fine. The erosion controls are still in place. They've actually um, done quite a bit of um, reinforcing of the existing erosion controls. Um, and if I, I can pull up the photos um, to show you some pictures, if you just bear with me a moment. Um, so this is, this is that corner. Um, and this is like the location where the little basin would be basically. And then there would be a check dam here and then sort of a swale that was directed down in this way. But there's, they've reinforced with hay bales here. They've put hay bales along the channel that's caught, um, being created. And then there's a lot of hay bales down here as well, just to keep silt from crossing over that barrier. And I did look and there's no silt that's gone beyond the erosion control barrier. So they've done a good job of, um, keeping the material on the site and um, from moving down towards the resource. So um, it's basically asking the commission, would you consider this as a minor administrative change to address the site conditions and stabilize it? I'm certainly comfortable with that. It seems like this will only improve erosion control measures um, already working at the site. Um, probably make it easier to maintain the silt fence that they have there anyway. So um, it certainly seems logical and protects the resource. Makes sense. To I me. concur. Okay. Thank you. Too. I'm definitely uh, with it, and I'm happy the applicants willing to do this. Same. Yeah. Thank them for their cooperation with this, Aaron. Absolutely. Um, and so. What I'd like to do is just to um, approve it as a, as a motion and then just grant them um, a correspondence and attach the plan, send it to, to DEP so that DEP can see that we've made this field change. And, um, and that's about it. Okay, just looking for the motion. Yep, I will uh, make a motion to 
approve rent emergency certification for request for minor administrative change order of conditions for Vista Terra tariff. Oh, no, I'm kidding, just kidding. I'm making a draft motion to approve minor administrative change to DEP number 089-0626 to allow remediation of runoff issue. Second. Hey, voice vote, Leroy. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so a couple things. Um, uh, I did reach out to foresters per Michelle's comments. Um, it's a little bit of a, a back and forth and I actually had a good conversation with um, Andre in the field about this as well. Um, one of the cuts, which is actually the, at the, the um, forested part of the poor farm, they um, are very um, interested in trying to work with around Michelle's comments for ground nesting birds. And they have discussed um, pushing the cut to basically they say they said August, it wouldn't happen till August or it would be in the winter um, that the cut would take place. So, um, but they're very conscientious They're They said that they do, they are very conscientious of birds on the site or wildlife to try to make sure that there's no impacts. Um, I also spoke with John Clark. He's the forester for the second um, forest cut plan, which um, had already passed its 10 day period. However, um, you know, I, I did talk to him and he, his, his comments, which I, I did um, understand were basically, he, he saw this as a, a habit of more of a landscape habitat improvement that would benefit birds. And um, it, it's apparently an old, um, red pine stand that there's like very little in the way of um, low growing vegetation on the site. And um, he, he didn't think that it would be a real impact to, to birds, but, you know, it's an interesting discussion. And Andre and I did talk about the fact that it might be interesting to get some guidance from the U S fish and wildlife service on this for the future, just to make sure that any comments that we provide are, um, that we take those factors into consideration. And um, I, I'm kind of interested to hear what US Fish and Wildlife would say about the DCR cutting plans anyways, because you know a lot of times the cutting plans do happen when it's nesting season. So um, I don't know if there's any follow-up comment on that or um, if there's anything the commission wants to discuss relative to that. Michelle and Andre, you guys are, are have the expertise in this. Um, does that seem like a, are you guys comfortable with moving forward with that plan? Uh, I could say that the, the first uh, plan that uh, was mentioned, um, being that it's going to be in the, in the fall or winter, um, I mean, that's uh, the ideal time in order to avoid uh, affecting nesting, um, nesting birds. And I think that's really good that they're uh, looking to uh, looking to uh, do that. Um, as far as the habitat improvement uh, um, that was mentioned with the um, uh, with a red pine uh, stand, I can certainly understand that. I would. I'm not an expert in uh, habitat improvement, so I wouldn't. You know, I. I I'm not sure how uh, what how to take their word for it, if you would. Um, and uh, I think also that uh, you know I I can't speak for Fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, although I used to. Um, uh, perhaps if they really want to do uh, something in accordance with uh, uh, with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, uh, they uh, could certainly talk to uh, folks here in Hadley. But um, I think it's a good thing that uh, that uh, the first uh, group is going to uh, the first cut's going to be uh, done uh, after the uh, breeding season and nesting season. I think it's really good. Great, Michelle. Can I say something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the first plan that's great. Um, I don't see why not. I mean, 
August and winter, ideally winter should just be the go-to for, you know, leafless tree cutting. So the, the other one, what I remember reading that it was a red maple stand and maybe that was a typo, but a red pine stand, I guess I'd be less concerned about, but a red maple stand, I mean, that's, that's a native tree with potentially more um, nesting birds in it. And just to correct what Aaron said, it's not the ground nesting birds, but late July and especially like June's the nesting season, late July, that's the post fledging season. And there's, you know, baby birds on the ground hiding in the bushes there. And what I remember reading is that they're also cutting the shrub um, surrounding the forest, which would sort of be like the habitat where the birds could then escape to once they are cutting and disturbing the forest. So I I'm, I'm have to admit that I'm disappointed that they're not willing in a habitat improvement project just to bump the date to a time when it's not gonna be harming the animals. But then again, if it's a red pine stand, I am, I am less concerned. So um, what was really helpful actually, uh, Michelle, was that you emailed me before and kind of expressed some concerns. If you'd like, you could do the same thing and then I could forward them to John Clark um, and just see, you know, if the landowner was willing to consider those things. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, I think it opens up a, a bigger conversation as far as DCR, you know, because DCR is approving these forest cutting plans and the impacts to birds. And I think, you know, in the town of Amherst, it's a consideration. So um, maybe it's a broader conversation that we have with them about our concern with it and see what their um, feedback is on that or how they, how they respond to that, especially relative to the Migratory Bird Act. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked that a um, habitat improvement grant wouldn't have some guidelines for, um, you know, best management practices or mitigation for uh, wildlife impacts in the, in the process of the work. Okay, yeah, these, thank you. These are great comments and considerations, and it sounds like something we need to kind of um, uh, position ourselves to be part of that conversation um, moving forward. Michelle, would you mind? It sounds like the best thing to do is is you, if you can capture this in a correspondence to Erin only, um, that way that she can correspond with the forester and see if given, see, get some clarification on what kind of red tree we have going on here, because I agree. Also, red cutting in a red maple stand would be strange because that's usually, they're also called the swamp maple. So that would be pretty low elevation cutting. Um, but yeah, clarification on exactly what kind of tree we have and if there's any way to kind of combine forces between um, birds and the other habitat restoration goals of the cutting. Yeah, Is I that, that okay with you? Okay, great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks everyone. Um, okay, Erin, I'm gonna let you. So it's 736. Should we open the RDA for 21 East Hadley Road? Um, I think 80 Pine Street might be first oh. in my... I have 21 East Hadley Road first. Oh. Agenda. Maybe I messed up the order. So let me jump to that one. Sorry about that. Okay. I have to get my RDA language anyway. It's in here somewhere. All right. So I'll open this hearing. Um, this public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protections under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, so 21 East Hadley Road, if you are representing the owner or the owner for this application, if you could raise your hand, I will bring you in. You it should be Lance Curley. Lance, I'm promoting you to a panelist. If there's anyone else, raise your hand and I'll bring you in. Lance, we can see you're here, but we can't see you or hear Hi you. there. I'm working oh. on start video here. Okay, 
Awesome. I'm gonna get these hearing tools. Select another video camera and settings. Sorry, I'm working on a new laptop tonight. Um, I usually work from my office, but I'm in Maryland tonight. So I may be limited to, let's see here. The camera is not cooperating at the moment. Let's see if I can try this. Does that work? As much as we'd like to see you, Lance, it's really okay as long as we can hear you. Um, okay. I'll make sure and, to speak up. <laughs> okay, great. And if you want us to pull up any specific site plans, do you want to tell us which site plan to, to pull up and screen share? Yep, Aaron we'll and um, uh, Andre, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Ward's. Smith, our wetland uh, expert, all met on site on Monday and I shared some new documents that were slightly revised and updated from the original RDA submission made by Ward Smith about a month ago. Okay. And yeah, uh, we're seeing that now, it looks like. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So Lance, if you could just give us a three minute, just introduce yourself, remind us where we are in the arc of this project um, and give us a brief overview of the of the application that would be great yeah sure so we were um so i'm one of the principals at classic colonial homes we're a design build firm based in florence mass and um, we were contacted by the homeowner um, last year to discuss a potential renovation project on this uh, historic Cape House, um, which we um, were able to come to agreement on and, and took on the project. And we are currently working through a construction uh, project there which is more extensive than we had originally intended. Uh, the, the project has um, kind of ballooned as we're discovering new things and kind of pulling away old bits and pieces of the existing historic house and um, kind of reconfiguring some areas that we had not intended when we first um, signed on with the, with the client, but knew that there may be some things we uncovered along the way. Um, the purpose of the RDA we submitted was to um, obtain permission to expand slightly upon the existing footprint of the historic home. And uh, that required drilling some holes for some ground contact and currently Aaron is pointing out those specific locations. Um, originally, I would say in my mind, the most kind of um, significant request was the addition of a mudroom entry in the larger lower blue circle uh, that was going to infill an existing inside corner between two of the existing uh, buildings and actually extend out beyond the face of the outermost building, uh, requiring several sonnet tubes, which are kind of cardboard tubes filled with concrete to support this addition. And that was the information submitted in this RDA. And in the last three weeks or so, uh, we came across some other aspects during our renovation that kind of forced a slightly different direction. And essentially we've reduced the size of that entryway. Um, so it is now in line with the existing building, not projecting out to the south of it and only requiring one ground poured concrete footing, which is identified with that arrow in the lower kind of southeast corner of that little addition. 
Um, we were originally asked to include any landscape, hardscape, or planting scope within this RDA submission, but our client um, decided that he would prefer to tackle any groundwork around the house construction that's underway now as a second ladder phase once they take delivery on the renovated home and have lived there for a period of time and determine what the best use uh, for their purposes will be for that landscape and hardscape plan. And so um, he's been made aware that there will be a second submission of that information to work with the town and um, where we are presently is the house there's we're seeing pictures of it here we have a silt fence up along east hadley road and the main house portion that looks like new construction is actually um, housing a original timber frame um, and then currently we're working on the midsection of the house where the uh, kitchen is located and this roof is being removed and walls are being reframed and adequately insulated and um, we'll be basically bringing this whole building back together within the course of the next month and a half or two months and then we'll be starting interior work on the structure. Okay, great. Thanks, Lance. Um, Aaron, I see you're flipping through site photos. Do, um, do you and were other commissioners able to make it want to give us a report from the field? Um, so I'll just I'll just jump in on that. So there there is sort of a, the road sort of represents a berm in between the, the site and the river for most of the um, most of the site. There is an exception to that, which is um, down in the um, southern most corner, which I didn't actually get a picture of. There's actually a drop inlet there. Um, so um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. Um, I did ask for the silt fence to be properly towed in and reinforced with a straw wattle. Um, we also discussed a couple other conditions um, in the field, which I think will work really well. And the applicant seemed um, fine with. Um, so again, the first one was um, fixing, repairing the silt fence so that it's functioning. Um, erosion control should be um, maintained and functioning through phase one. Um, once phase one uh, is completed, then the entire site should be stabilized. And, you know, the manner of stabilization is less important than the fact that the site is stabilized. So whether it's grass seed and straw, wood chip mulch, or erosion control blankets, whatever they want to do is fine as long as it's stable. Um, once it's stabilized, um, then I would do an inspection that they could then remove the erosion controls. And then uh, there would be an, a condition, an additional condition that on phase two, which is the landscaping work, they're proposing to rebuild a bunch of stone walls and do a bunch of plantings on the site, that that be completed. Um, they're going to have to file an RDA for that work as well. Um, and I just set this arbitrary date of September 30th, uh, 2023, because um, I believe um, Lance had said, um, fall of 2023, they would be looking to start that work. And that is to compensate for some tree removal that was done on site. Apparently, um, in the course of the renovation, there was a bunch of rot on the front side of the house, and they um, took out a couple trees around the foundation without approval. Um, so we would just like to have that permit um, as part, you know, conditioned as part of this permit so that they come through with phase two. And then just a condition for no additional um, vegetation or stump removal on the site unless approved by the Conservation Commission. Um, it's relatively simple and straightforward project, really. Um, I didn't have any major glaring issues with it. And um, the applicant was really cooperative to address my concerns. So um, 
I would be comfortable issuing a negative determination under the Wetland Protection Act. Thanks, Erin. Um, commissioners, any questions, comments? I reviewed the materials. Everything looked pretty straightforward to me. Erin, I agree with your recommendation. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, uh, just with the uh, short amount of experience I have, which is practically none, um, but uh, the paperwork and the, uh, the actual uh, site it looks very straightforward. Exactly what uh, what Aaron said. That was was the word that was in my mind. Yeah. So it seems like a minimal impact. I think with these conditions, um, a negative RDA is appropriate. I agree, Aaron, that within this RDA conditioning that we make sure we get an RDA for the replanting um, is a good move. Lance, I appreciate your cooperation and organization on this, but yeah, um, it's important to get that second RDA for the planting. Um, and thanks for keeping the SNEC under control at the site and kind of up to snuff. Um, Cause I think it's gonna be a wet, a wet few weeks here. And I hate to see that all that exposed soil just pipe right into the adjacent wetland. So thank you. Yep, without a um, doubt, thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, unless commissioners have other questions or concerns, I think we're looking for the motion. Oh, Aaron has a comment. You just might want to check if there's any public comment oh, on this. Thank you for reminding me. Um, we have a lot of attendees. So if you are here with any, if you're in a butter or a member of the public here with interest in the um, RDA for 21 East Hadley Road, and you have a comment or question, please raise your hand. not seeing anyone. Thank you for the reminder. I thought of that while Lance was talking and then promptly forgot. Um, so I think we're ready for a motion. Commissioners. I move to issue a negative determination of applicability checking box two with required noted conditions and a positive determination of applicability checking box five. Second it. Okay, we have Michelle in the motion, Laura on the second. Voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Larry. Oh, you're muted, Larry. Aye. Thank you, Andre. Aye. Leroy. Aye. I'm an aye. Lance, thank you. We'll, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your help with this. Yep. Good luck out there. And we'll, we'll see you in a couple months, a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Have a nice evening. You too. Okay. All right. Great work. I think, let's see, just checking the time. 7.50. Oh yeah. So I'm going to open. This is a new notice of intent. Checking in. Are we good to move on to um, 80 Pine Street, Aaron? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna open this NOI. Uh oh, oh good. All right, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to protection of wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, so this is the first hearing for the first discussion of an NOI um, for renovation of an existing house, removal of existing barn and restoration plantings in the riverfront area of Mill River. And this is at 80 Pine Street in Amherst. Um, I'm assuming is a consultant or applicant planning on being here, Aaron, do you know? Uh, so um, Alan... Um, Saint, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank Pierre. on his last name. Yeah. He, yeah. And then, um, uh, Mike Liu from Berkshire Design, we're, okay. we're presenting. I see Mike, I'll bring you in. I see Alan, I'll bring you in. Okay. Um, let's see. I can't see. Aaron, would you mind stopping sharing? Of course. Second? Yep. Of course. Okay. Mike and Alan, I see that you guys are here, but we cannot hear you. Oh, now I see you, Mike. 
Okay. And I can hear you. Okay. Can you yell? Great. Okay. Great. Got, thanks. Just got yeah. the controls on. Okay. There's good. Alan. Alan's here too. <clears throat> Hi, Alan. We see you. And we can hear you. Awesome. Um, okay, so I would ask Mike or Alan to introduce yourselves and then give us a three minute overview of the permit application. Sure, um, I can go. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Michael Liu with the Brookshire Design Group. Um, on behalf of Alan St. Hilaire with Valley Property Management, who is representing the owner, Killerine um, Properties, uh, for 80 Pine Street. Um, this is a project to basically reconstruct an, an addition um, that's on the back of the house at 80 Pine Street, um, creating a larger footprint. Uh, this is on this survey. Thanks, Aaron. Um, am I having control here? You... Um, I, I have oh. control, but I okay. can move it wherever you need okay. or highlight anything um, you need. This is, kind of, this is a survey that was done by our office and in the hatched area you see in the back of 80 um, Pine Street, that's the existing footprint uh, where it says one story. That's being removed and the existing barn, uh, which is closer to the Mill River there is being removed. Um, the new addition, well, let me just go through a real quick figure. The barn, that addition, and a small piece of the stone walk that's in between those two clumps of bushes at the barn is being removed. And that totals 1,325 square feet. Um, the proposed building, which is on the next plan, um, totals 896 uh, square feet. So, we're getting a net decrease in impervious area of 429 square feet on the site. Um, so impervious area is being reduced and there's the proposed um, condition plan with the addition shaded in. Um, and then the area where the barn um, is to be taken down, the ground would be leveled out underneath the barn. It, it currently, um, the barn sits on piers so you can kind of see under it. Um, excavate from the from the new building or addition area would be used to kind of fill in and level out the the ground under the barn um, and we're proposing to plant a conservation wildlife seed mix there um, supplemented with 10 high bush blueberries uh, blueberry shrubs um, we looked at the site I don't know if Aaron you want to flash through some photos um, of the site but basically, I think it's a pretty straightforward project. Um, in generally, it's a it's an improvement to the riverfront area in that there's a decrease in impervious area, and we're doing the restoration um, plantings in the barn area. So we're creating a better um, condition there. There were some concerns that were brought up on the site visit, and we can go over those after. Maybe they're shown in the photos. Um, that's the barn from uh, looking from west to east behind the barn here, that in that photo right there, this is on the north side of the barn and you can see where the top of the slope goes down and you can see the Mill River in the background there. Um, but this area here, there's some old debris and some concrete pieces and you see a, um, a set of precast concrete steps that are in the background there at the corner of the barn. This would all be removed um, and then the, uh, We'd, we'd be putting in the straw wattle erosion control from the um, across the entire length of the or the width of the lot across the um, top of the slope there. Um, the barn would be taken down with an excavator, the material um, put into a dumpster, most likely. And when the you know when it's filled, they take it off site and bring back an empty dumpster and and continue the process. So that would be the process of taking down the barn and um, the existing addition and the back of a house. Um, there's no basement proposed, but there would still be some excavation to put in a foundation for the addition that would replace um, the existing. And um, so that soil from that footprint would be used, as I mentioned, to uh, level out and um, a fill in and level out the area underneath the barn. Um, Aaron had sent um, ahead of time some um, comments and draft conditions, which 
Alan had indicated that he didn't have any problems with um, any of these. So if we want to discuss anyone in particular, or if any of the commissioners have other concerns or questions, then we can um, uh, hopefully answer those and provide responses. Yeah, thanks. I followed all of that. Thanks, Aaron, for the virtual site tour. Um, and thank you, Mike, for the numbers on the net reduction in the resource. Mm -hmm. in the buffer. Sure. Did that. Um, so nothing pops to mind. I see, I saw the sediment erosion control at the top of the slope on the plan. I agree with that. I think everything we, anything we can do just to protect that slope. And as you said, restore as much as possible under that barn is great. Um, those would have been my questions, but you guys have already answered them. It sounds like stockpiling, everything's going to be removed from the site as you go. So we're not going to have anything sitting in that like fragile resource area. Um, I've also read these conditions and I'm comfortable with them. Commissioners, does anyone have any questions or comments? Nope. Yeah, just that I appreciate the thoughtfulness um, that went into this. So thanks for taking us through the proposal in such detail. Um, I think it overall, it'll be a, a benefit to the site when it's all done. Agreed, thanks, Laura. Aaron, any outstanding concerns? Um, so my concerns were the that erosion that we saw um, around the, the barn, and I did ask that um, once they get the barn down that they put some erosion control blanket, uh, once they get the debris out um, and, and sort of regrade to put some erosion control blankets on the extent of that slope to stabilize it. Um, and then I think the, the seed on the flat part where the barn is sitting will, will work great, and I think that the, you know, there's going to be a straw wattle there and plantings there. So I think that's gonna be a really nice improvement. Um, there was, you know, the, the area, I wasn't quite sure what was happening with, you know, downspouts, roof gutters, um, foundation drains and things like that. Um, but I did speak with them about that and uh, they were willing to provide either um, stone at the outlets or the, you know, the concrete level spreaders um, at the outlets. And we're gonna make sure that there's no um, downspouts being placed in unstable areas that could cause erosion. I'm particularly concerned about putting it on the neighboring property or towards the slope in the back. Um, excavated material um, from the foundation, as, as um, Mike said, is not going to be stockpiled on site. It's actually going to be reused to fill in the hole that's underneath the barn. So I think that'll be a really nice because um, we won't have to worry about stockpiles sitting there. Um, and then let me see here. Um, during, during the work, the um, excavator will be sitting in the area between the barn and the house to take everything down and all that material is going to be taking off taken off site um, yeah and no vegetation no trees or vegetation needs to be removed from the site they said they might um, need to remove a little bit of two clusters of lilac bushes but they might try to repurpose those somewhere else on the property so um, I think it's a good project. It, it, I didn't have any outstanding concerns and all of my concerns were addressed. So um, I'm comfortable conditioning it with, um, approving it with conditions listed. Okay, thanks, Darren. I'm just gonna take a second and check for any public comment. Um, I see we have several attendees of the meeting. If you're here um, with questions or comments about the notice of intent for 80 Pine Street in Amherst, raise your hand. Not seen anyone. Okay, all right. Um, well, with that, Erin, would you mind sharing again? So Absolutely, yep, no problem. Um, commissioners, we're looking for a motion. Yep, I'll make a motion to issue an order of conditions, uh, DEP 09697 with the noted conditions above. I second that. Second from Andre. All right, voice vote. Andre. Yes. Laura. Aye. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Uh, Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I'm an aye. 
All right, um, Alan, Mike, thank you. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. All right. Night. We'll leave you. All right. Have a good have, night. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. All right. Okay. So we have one more hearing. Checking the time, 7.40. Oh, yeah, we're good. All right. So this is a continuation from the last meeting. Um, a request for determination for zero Tuckerman Lane and zero Kingman Road. So this is our plan for this hearing. Um, I'm going to give Aaron a couple of minutes to update us on um, activities since the last hearing, um, since the last meeting, including this hearing. Um, and then I'm going to ask for a three minute update from the consultant and the owner for the application. Um, and then we will um, discuss it as a commission and figure out how to move forward. Oh, sorry. After we have the three minutes from the um, applicant, we'll go to public comment. Um, and I know I see a lot of attendees here. I'm assuming you're all here for this hearing. Thank you for being here and keeping track of it um, to be here again this week. Uh, what we'll do is have a limit of two minutes per person and ask that you um, keep your questions and comments relevant to our jurisdiction, um, which is protecting the wetland resources, namely the stream, intermittent stream located at the bottom of the slope um, relative to this property. So we're going to keep it a tight ship. Um, please raise your hand if you have any comments or questions, um, and we'll do our best to uh, make sure everyone's heard. Um, so with that, Aaron, do you want to catch us up on activities since our last meeting? Sure. So um, immediately following the meeting, um, the, the morning after the meeting, um, Myself and Dave Zomek um, and Jen met uh, via Zoom just to sort of discuss the outcome of the, the meeting. It was a pretty unusual meeting. Um, and so um, we wanted to just sort of debrief on that. And I think all of us felt um, that for this particular site that the RDA process was not working um, to get compliance with the wetland violation and that um, the we basically felt that enforcement might be a good option there, but we wanted to consult with DEP. So I did contact Tom Gruzkos from DEP um, and sort of explained the background of the situation. And he um, agreed that an enforcement order would be a correct course of action for us to take um, in order to get that slope um, restored that was cut. Um, I also consulted the town attorney just to um, run by sort of the outcome of the meeting, and they were also supportive of um, issuing enforcement for the site. So uh, I issued an enforcement order requiring slope stabilization and replanting. Um, and then uh, today, so I guess the, the thought is to keep the enforcement and the um, permit application separate as much as possible, um, just I guess as a result of comments that were made by um, the applicant's consultant, it just seems like it might be a cleaner way to do this. Um, a lot of times the commission does use RDAs to uh, sort of as an olive branch to resolve enforcement situations, um, but in this case it just it doesn't seem to be the right course. So um, we understand that and, and that's why we took that action. Um, um, and so with that said, we did get a revised plan this evening, which shows the work pushed out of Conservation Commission jurisdiction, which I think is a really positive thing. So um, that is my update and um, happy to answer any other questions. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, so I'm gonna quickly outline what, our, what we had the kind of decision tree here, but first I want to see, does anyone have any clarifying questions, commissioners, for Aaron's update? Okay, so we have two separate tracks here. One is this RDA and the other is the enforcement order. The RDA is what is the, is the topic of this public hearing. So we're going to stick to discussing the RDA here as a public hearing. 
Um, because the applicant has responded to our request and moved the building envelope out of our jurisdiction, really the appropriate move here is to have a negative determination. Um, so they have responded to our request for information. They've responded to everything we've asked in terms of the RDA. Um, so the slope stabilization um, in response to the violation of the Weapons Protection Act is gonna be handled under the enforcement order. So just to clarify, I mean, this really isn't jurisdictional anymore. Um, I'm going to go ahead and if um, Dan Lewis or Erica, if you have any further comment relative to the RDA, um, please raise your hand and I can bring you in. Um, and again, I just wanna say if there's any interrupting or um, if we're not able to discuss and talk, then I'm going to take people out of, of the, as panelists. So um, Erica, I'm gonna promote you for a, a maximum of a three minute um, update. I'm gonna bring you in as a panelist. Sorry, there's a delay. Dan has his hand raised as well. Dan, I'm gonna bring you in. Hi, Erica. Hi folks, how are you doing? Good to see you and hear you. Let's just wait for Dan. There's Dan. Hi, Dan, we can see you and hear, hopefully hear you. Can you hear you, Dan? I can hear you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for being back. Um, so do you have any further updates? You heard me just say that because thank you for pulling, pulling the building envelope out of our jurisdiction. Um, we appreciate that. And we're willing to issue a, a negative determination on this RDA. Um, do you have any further information relevant to the RDA to share with us tonight? No, not at all. All right. <laughs> um, so with that, I think I'm going to move you guys out of the panel and then take public comment. Yeah, go ahead, Erica. I'm so sorry, Jen. Um, the only point that I wanted to make was that while the commission was discussing a negative determination, we were also asking for um, the wetland line to be confirmed. And I'm sure that you guys will figure that out in the motions, but just so that we didn't skip that portion where that would be, you know, a positive determination for the delineation. And I just didn't want to skip that portion. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, we have to issue like three basically, but we also have to address both zero Tuckerman and zero Pigman separately. So I think we have that teed up. <laughs> I think we're ready. Thank you, Erica. Um, so. I'm gonna move you guys to attendees. All right. Um, now, members of the public, I would, this is our moment to take any questions or comments. And just to clarify, um, in case this is kind of the burning question, there's again, two like regulatory avenues that we're tracking in parallel right now. One is this request for determination um, which is going to be a negative determination, which means they do not file a full permit. And that is because they have pulled the building envelope out of the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission per our request at the last meeting. Um, the enforcement order will be discussed separately after the public hearing, and you're welcome to stay in the meeting and listen to that discussion. Um, but that's how we'll go about understanding the course forward for the um, stabilization of the slope um, that was cut in violation of the Wetlands Protection Act. So members of the public, if you have a question or comment, if you could raise your hand, I can allow you to talk. Um, there were some hands, but now they're down. Charlie, oh, they're back. Charlie, <laughs> um, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. Sorry for the delay tonight, folks. I don't know why it's slower than usual. 
Okay, Charlie, we can see like your picture, but we can't hear you yet. You're muted. Yes, hi. Um, so I'm Charlie Schweik. I'm on a butter um, to zero Tuckerman lane. And um, I, I just want to clarify my one question has to do with uh, um, what um, the town wetlands administrator was raising last week, last meeting about runoff um, and what's going to happen on that. And so is that part of the enforcement discussion? So we can go through the enforcement in detail outside of this public hearing, um, but where we would really talk about runoff is if this went to a full permit for work. Um, and because they've pulled the building envelope out of our jurisdiction, we um, can't, there's the, there's not gonna be an impact of runoff to the resource because they're outside of the, the buffer and outside of our jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, Aaron, I'm, I'm, do you wanna, sorry, Charlie, let me just give Erin a second in case she can catch what I missed. So, and just to clarify, so the it's out of jurisdiction unless there's another violation where material starts to move down the slope or into the resource area. Um, so as long as we can avoid that from happening, then um, it would remain the, the work that's um, associated with the home construction at Zero Kingman and Zero Tuckman would be non-jurisdictional. Um, to address your, your question specifically, Charlie, um, I think it would be worthwhile just to speak to the building department in town and just bring your concerns to their attention because they're going to be reviewing um, probably like the driveway permit and the um, building construction permit. And so um, they should be addressing that with the builder to make sure that there's no um, uh, runoff issues that are happening associated with the home construction that's outside of our jurisdiction. Okay, uh, the, the, you know, my understanding of this whole process was that um, uh, respectfully, this is a professional developer who I would think will understand the bylaws and I've looked at the bylaws and they seem pretty simple. Um, and so there was a process that was skipped where we would have been able to talk about trees, that slope, all these things, and that was bypassed illegally from my understanding, if I'm understanding it correctly. Yeah. So, so, um, so I'm frustrated about that. And now it seems like now, okay, now because they've moved the footprint, uh, we can't even discuss this now. It's not that we can't discuss it. It's that we're handling it under an enforcement order. Um, so it's separate from the RDA permit application. So the fact that there was a violation of the Wetlands Protection Act is you know, has not been forgotten. And um, we can talk about it in the enforcement order portion of the agenda. We'll put up the enforcement order so people can see it's also publicly available, um, that that's how we're kind of going about stabilizing and restoring that slope. So we hear that concern. We were also very concerned with that after last meeting. The policy lever we went for, which was an RDA, wasn't the tool that we should have used to best address this. And that's why we went forward with an enforcement order. Um, and that's the, the best tool we have to kind of address the, the work that's already been done in, within our jurisdiction at the site. So okay. thank you, um, Charlie. Thank you. And I would encourage you to um, listen to the end when we talk of the meeting after this public hearing when we talk about the enforcement order. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here, for your questions. Um, all right. I don't see any other raised hands. Up, oh, Stephanie. I think that's a Stephanie. I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me cover this. I should, oh, I have to do, do video. And this may just be a quick question. So is there a time for public input on the enforcement part? So there's not, it's not part of this public hearing. Um, uh, so but we've captured everything we can about the concern for the risk to the resource within our jurisdiction in that enforcement order, um, which will detail outside of this public hearing. But because this public hearing is no longer in our jurisdiction, 
we can't, it's just not appropriate to discuss uh, it here. Okay, I guess I just want to say this anyway. First, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. And I believe I'm in a butter's a butter. So, um, but I'm concerned about the environmental impact. And it just seems there's a real pattern in our state, if not our country, that basically the thing of asking forgiveness, just cut the trees down and then find bureaucratic ways around it. So I hope that the your enforcement will have them actually replacing stuff with real native plantings that the trees are at least three foot diameter trunks. And, you know, that something's really done so that it it doesn't all just slide down the hill into the swamp. So that was all I wanted to say. Thanks. We hear you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. Um, Brenda, see your hand, promoting you to panelist. Hi. I just wanted to ask the builder, um, because he broke the law and took down all these trees without any um, uh, notice to the abutters, as if in a good faith gesture, he would plant trees along the train tracks on Zero Kingman. It's just a request. It is not part of the RDA or this Conservation Commission, but we would request it. We'd appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions or comments relative relevant to this this RDA? Seems like no. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Lily, I am promoting you to panelists. Can you I, hear we can hear you, Lily. Hi, my name is Lily and I am eight years old. I am very sad because so many trees are cut down. The woods are now so bare these days. They used to provide a peaceful and safe sanctuary for wildlife and clean oxygen for everyone on earth. And people should follow the laws. If we let this one go, other people might destroy the environment in the future too. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Lily, for making the time. That was really well said. And I think we all take our responsibility to protect this, this resource very, very seriously. Um, we're doing everything we can um, to try to, to protect this resource. Um, and we're glad we have the cooperation of, of the builder to move forward with this. So thank you, Lily. Commissioners, any other responses or comments for Lily? Nope. Okay. Thank you again. We really appreciate you being here. Jen, could I just make one other, just, I want to make sure that something's very clear. Yep. The, the plan revision came in at 4.30 this afternoon, um, or a little after four this afternoon. I didn't see it till 4.30. So I just wanted to make sure that members of the public are aware of that, that um, you know, up until 4.30 this afternoon, we were looking at a very different plan. And so um, and our jurisdiction only goes to um, a 100 foot buffer beyond the wetland limit. And from a state and local um, regulatory standpoint, those are the only areas that we have jurisdiction to regulate um, or take action to protect. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear to everyone because I think it got kind of lost. Yeah, thank you. I did say jurisdiction, but didn't clarify that it's really outside of that 100 foot buffer. Um, Thanks, Erin. All right, Lily, thank you again. I'm gonna um, change your role back to an attendee. I see, Brenda, do you still, do you have another comment or question? Okay, I think this is the last one, Brenda. It's coming back.
For some reason, it's not. Can you try promoting, Brenda, Aaron? I just, just did, yeah. It doesn't seem to be reacting. I've had that happen to me before. Oh, there she oh, comes. There she goes. There's a delay tonight on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, this just came in at 4.30. Then how does anyone have enough time to review this to make a decision? I so need time. <laughs> Aaron, I mean, business practice, how can it come in at 4.30 for a seven o'clock meeting? To me, this is just more the same that we're seeing from this builder and this consultant. I'm really disappointed in this. Point taken. Um, we're doing what we can with the policy levers we have here to protect our resource. Um, and now that the project is outside of that 100 foot buffer, it's not jurisdictional for us. We are take, taking the enforcement order very seriously. Um, and that we can, we'll discuss as a commission outside of this public hearing. Um, so th thank you for the point and for being here, Brenda. Um, we certainly hear your frustration. I just wanted to pull up the plan so that folks could see the um, <laughs> intermittent streamline in light blue, the wetland line in dark blue, and then the um, 50 foot and 100 foot buffers. And you can see that the building envelope was moved to outside of the 100 foot. So um, it's a relatively simple plan to, to dissect in that way. Thanks, Erin. All right, um, public, this is our, our last call for any public comments or questions. We appreciate you all being here. The public hearing portion of this, um, we're gonna discuss as a commission and then likely close that hearing. Um, we'll talk about the enforcement order at the end of the meeting um, tonight and then likely in future meetings. So um, stay tuned to the agenda to, to keep in touch with what's going on. Um, Again, like we're doing everything we can to protect the resource. We're using um, the best tools we have uh, to, to try to, to get this sorted out. So um, thank you for your attendance and for being here tonight. Um, so with that uh, commission, I'm gonna suggest that we, well, Aaron, should I go ahead and close the public hearing and then we can make our motions? Or do you want to? Um, yes. Yeah, I would close the public okay. hearing first on this one. Okay. Yeah. So, commissioners, I think at this point we can close the public hearing because we've given everyone a chance to um, ask questions and make comments. So, I just need a motion to close the public hearing. I move that we po uh, close the public hearing for the uh, RDA 0 Kingman Road and 0 Tuckman Lane. Second. I have a second from Andre, a motion from Leroy. And so voice vote, Andre. Yay. Uh, Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, so commissioners, you can read this motion quickly. Um, I think this is a pretty clear cut situation in that um, the applicant has responded to our request to move the building envelope outside of our jurisdiction. Um, so unless anyone has any clarifying questions or, or comments relevant to the RDA, uh, I think we're looking for that motion. I, I have a comment. I assume that by doing this, by the fact that they've moved this, they've moved the building area outside, that the town planning board, et cetera, and the town itself will, will make, maintain that they do not expand beyond that envelope. Does that make so sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yes. they're right on the line, right? So we're, we're pretty sure about that line. I mean, part of part of the issue here has to do with things like decks, 
swimming pools, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got the building envelope that's been reduced to a size that takes it out of our jurisdiction, but those kinds of things still fall within the town. So who is involved in making the decision about that? Yeah, and it's really the, the building department. Um, so part of the, re part of the reason I'm saying this is because the people in the, our, 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 our people are out there listening to this and want to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And it's not, we are not negating what's happening. Right. It's just we're shifting the responsibility to somebody else. Well, we're not shifting it. The responsibility is shifted by the nature of the fact that exactly. it's now exactly. outside of our jurisdiction. Yes. So I exactly. hang on, Andre, I see you. Hang on, hang on a second. Um, yeah, so Larry, that's a great point. And Aaron made this point in a response to public comment. And that is, um, if you're concerned about moving forward, things like driveways, porches, runoff, um, really the building department or the people to contact about that. Um, and I mean, Erin is swamped, but she can point you in the right direction if you contact her. Dave Zomack, the assistant town manager, can also be a great contact for who at the building permit to be in touch with um, to make sure that uh, we're vigilant um, or understand what's going on um, as this, this site is, as this residential property is developed. Um, so thank you, Larry, for that point, that clarifying point. Andre, what did I miss? Or, Further questions or comments? I, th I just think uh, that the com the, to expand a little bit uh, for the public's uh, understanding about uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the CONCOM is that uh, once it's outside of the 100 uh, feet, um, in this case, um, they, they've moved the envelope uh, outside of uh, the 100 feet, which is the jurisdiction of the uh, Conservation Commission. Therefore, the Conservation Commission has no authority to um, uh, to impose any further uh, any further uh, conditions, etc. In terms of the actual building, and like, and I think it's uh, that the public needs to understand the fact that. Uh, that it is now outside of uh, the scope of the authority of the CONCOM. And that is, I'll just add, the project moving forward is the violation of the Wetland Protection Act with the clearing inside the 100 foot buffer is still within our jurisdiction and we are doing the best we can to have that stabilized and somewhat restored via an enforcement order, which we'll discuss once we've move forward with this, this hearing and moved on with the agenda in the meeting. So we have by no means let go of any violations. We are just using the appropriate policy tools to chase that down so that we can best protect the resource. Again, our concern here is stabilization of the slopes so that we do not have erosion and degradation of water quality in the resource area. Um, any thank you, Andre. I appreciate that. And Larry, great points. Um, we can't say this enough that the commission really takes our responsibility to protect this resource very seriously, and we're navigating this like as best we can. Um, Mich anyone? Oh, Aaron, go ahead. I just wanted to respond to Larry's comment um, about the the boundary of that hundred foot uh, buffer and. Um, you know, I drafted the enforcement order. I kept it pretty simple, but the commission can modify that enforcement order once we get to that discussion and requiring that 100 foot boundary to be clearly marked is something that the commission can require. Um, to, and also the commission can require that area to be um, protected in some way that that area that's been cleared to be protected in some way. So we can condition that into the enforcement order. You guys can modify it however you like. Um, and you can make a motion to modify the enforcement order I issued or ratify it, um, reissue it with changes, whatever you'd like to do with that, we can incorporate that to address that violation. But as Jen has said, let's close this out so that we can get there. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thanks everyone um, for your attention to this. Um, it hasn't been an easy one to navigate. Um, 
but we ultimately appreciate the applicant moving this building envelope outside of um, the 100 foot buffer. We think it'll be a better outcome for the resource here. Um, so I think commissioners, we're looking for a motion. This one right here, Jen? Yeah, yeah. yep. So it's the negative. We have to do several, <laughs> several parts. It's long, it's a paragraph. Yeah, because we have to address both properties. <clears throat> A uh, move that based on the plan, sketch title, document updated RDA sketch plan, uh, March 23, 2022. We move to issue a negative determination checking box one, not subject to Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, positive determination checking box 2A, BBW Bank Resources confirmed is accurate. Negative determination checking box four, non jurisdictional. Negative determination checking box six, under Amherst Wetland Bylaw. For Zero Kingman. Map 6C, lot 79, Zero Tuckman, and Map 6C, lot 80. Second. All right. Um, voice vote. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Andre. Aye. Cannot, and Andre, oh, no, I, uh, I'm going to should abstain, recuse. Okay. Yeah. Abstain, yeah. And um, I'm an I. All right. Um, and with that, that's the end of that RDA. Thank you, everyone, for your attention to this. Um, and I'm double checking the agenda. Looks like what we have left. I'm sorry, I don't have the PowerPoint open in front of me, Aaron, but it looks like we have a couple of, we have to discuss the ZR talking about the enforcement, the can't have enforcement. Um, what yep. else? And in what order do you want to go? <laughs> um, well, I just um, make a suggestion because we have people yeah. from the audience here. Don't we want to um, do Big Tucker when they're here? Yeah. Is that okay with you, Aaron? Fine with me. Yeah, I mean, it's completely up to the commission. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Not to make people stay up later than or stay on Zoom. Longer. Also, I'm gonna stop sharing just so I can open it up and share it with you guys. I think I sent it to you anyways, but yeah, let's just yeah. You mean the enforcement order, Aaron? Correct. Out? Yep. Okay. Then I think what we should do is review what we need to do, um, ratify or revise and ratify, and at what the procedure is for that, um, and also make it clear what we can change and not change and then discuss that as commissions. So um, it's pretty simple. Um, just notes the tree clearing disturbance in the buffer zone, violation of the Wetland Protection Act and Amherst Wetlands bylaw. Um, Activity has been conducted in an area subject to protection. And um, so I just wanted to point something out about this violation sort of right at the beginning. Um, I was contacted and I, you know, I deal with a lot of inquiries on a lot of properties. So this one didn't, um, when the permit, when the violation initially happened, it was, 11 months later. So I didn't recall this, but I did look back in my email and found an email um, dated January 6, 2021, where I had um, gotten an inquiry from Dan Lewis, where he was looking to purchase this property and asked if there was any resource issues. And I did specifically look at lot uh, 6C80, which is zero Tuckerman Lane, and noted that there was an intermittent stream um, and that any work within 100 feet of that stream would require a wetland filing. So I thought that was important to include because um, I did notify the owner that a permit was necessary in order to do any work within 100 feet of that stream. And then I just documented here that the complaint was received by the building department and passed on to me um, in mid-November and that uh, it was documented as a violation um, that the owner was advised of the violation and asked um, to file an after the fact request for determination, which we frequently do 
um, especially with single family home owners to try to avoid having to do enforcement action. Um, the owner worked to submit the RDA, but what was a little bit sort of confusing about this particular process was the application was supposed to be for addressing the violation. And when the application came in, it included construction of a single family home, construction of two single family homes. Um, and um, so I just wanted to make clear that, you know, that the violation wasn't really addressed with the RDA application anyways, which is, you know, where we sort of ran into trouble in the hearing um, with the restoration questions. Um, so I, I documented that in the um, enforcement order and um, that during the hearing process that it was made clear that um, they didn't want to restore the area that was cut on the slope in the buffer zone. And so we felt that, you know, this was the best course of action to independently deal with restoring that area. And I asked for a restoration plan to be filed. Um, and the restoration plan was supposed to be submitted tomorrow, which was supposed to be today, but that was an error on my part. In any case, um, a, sta a stabilization plan. And I think it's being ratified tonight anyway. We don't have a restoration plan in front of us, but I think that the, the point is for us, this is an opportunity for us to um, discuss what the commission would like to see in the form of restoration, um, in the form of stabilization, plantings, um, and also identifying that area clearly so that um, any work associated with the single family home construction um, is clearly demarcated from the restoration area. Um, and then also I did indicate that erosion controls, uh, stake straw wattle should immediately be, be installed at the top of the slope because there is already material migrating um, onto the slope and um, along the contour of the property that abuts the buffer zone with the intermittent stream and bordering vegetated wetlands. And that was the content of the enforcement order. Okay, and so I have a couple of procedural questions. Um, we have a we have a raised hand um, amongst the attendees, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I think we should give the commission an opportunity to discuss this, um, and then the commission should decide um, if you want to take public comment on it. Or you know, obviously, I think um, the applicant's representative should be given the opportunity to address. Um, the situation, but just that the commission might want to discuss it um, as a body. Okay. Sure. All right, commissioners, first, any clarifying questions about kind of what's included in the enforcement order? Yeah, Michelle. Yep. Um, so, yeah, just, just a clarifying question. Since we're not seeing the conditions or the restoration plan, if we ratify this, like, are we ratifying an advanced restoration plan? I just, I mean, my point is that I just want to see a restoration plan before I vote to ratify the enforcement order, if that's how this works. Well, so the, the way that it works is the enforcement order is really not legally binding until you ratify it. So if you don't ratify it, then it's not an enforcement order. So the, do we then get but, an approval process for the- Well, um, so let, let me back up, Michelle. You can say, Aaron, I'm throwing out your enforcement order. I don't like it. I want to issue a new, a different enforcement order and this is what I want it to require. You can be very specific about what you want it to require in the form of a restoration plan. Um, or response action that you want to be taken in response to the enforcement. You could require them to file a notice of intent to respond to the enforcement if you wanted to. Um, there's multiple options and I'll show you on, the, excuse me, on the form. Um, but one way or another, the, if the commission wants the enforcement to stand, there's gonna be some, have to be some sort of motion that makes it a legally binding document. Um, so, these are the options um, when you're issuing the enforcement order, and this is a state form. So um, you can tell them to cease and desist, which basically means just stop all activity on the site. Um, you can tell them just outright to correct the resource area to its original condition. You can require a restoration plan and you can specify what you want the restoration plan to um, address on the site. Um, 
you can ask them to file a notice of intent application with the issuing authority and you can specify a date by which they do that. Um, and then you can also require um, the owner to take um, uh, immediate action to correct the violation. The one thing I would caution the commission on is that if you um, tell them to cease and desist, they can't do anything on the site. So they can't install erosion controls. They can't do anything to stabilize. So you have, just have to be careful that whatever message you're sending with this is consistent. Okay, so can we, so a restoration plan by tomorrow is not realistic if we're ratifying it tonight. Can we revise the date of the restoration plan so we can say enforcement order with the following revisions and then ratify it? Okay. Yeah, with the following requirements, yeah. Um, how, whatever you wanna say. And you can even say, we want, you know, 30 native shrubs planted. We want, you know, 20, you know, however, you know, you can, you can require trees to be planted. You can require stabilization measures. You can require shrubs. Um, you can ask them to just put something together to propose um, and run that by you. And then you can comment on it. So um, there's a lot of flexibility with it. So does that address your question? Michelle, so we have to ratify this enforcement order and then there's subsequent discussion of whether the enforcement order conditions have been met. So it's not over. We're just saying this is what we're looking for from the enforcement order. Does that make sense? You can say I'd like to, this order's fine, but I'd like to modify X, Y, and Z and then ratify it as a board. Yeah. Or you can say I'd like to throw this, in, I'm not ratifying this. I'd like to issue a new enforcement order with new requirements, and this is what we want. Yeah. Okay, um, Larry. Sorry, Laura. One second. Larry has his hand visually raised. <laughs> Just one sec, Larry. Oh, you're. I think you're muted, Larry. Keep the noise down. Um, I'm. I'm a little concerned about that letter that we got earlier today, having to do with the fact that we don't necessarily have jurisdiction on any of these things. Now, it seems to me that this particular thing we're talking about now, having to do with the violation of the request that they are supposed to indicate what they're going to do, that they violated, that, that, isn't, that, that that's not a situation anymore, that we have jurisdiction over that in terms of what's happening here. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah, so Larry, we have jurisdiction over what occurred on the property. Like there's two separate parts of the discussion now. There's been a clear violation of the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, and that's what we're discussing now. So basically the path forward is, is what we're discussing. So what what Aaron's proposed and the documents that she shared with us are, you know, if you read it, well, I'm sure she'll pull it up at some point, but, you know, replanting native species, yeah, right, et cetera. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to just say one thing that I, I really would like to have the 100 foot, um, buffer zone clearly delineated here. I think just to prevent, just to have extra clarity on where that is. So that's- Can we have I a chain, can we have a chain fence? Hold on, Larry. Larry. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Larry, let's have, let's have Laura finish her thoughts. I was, I was gonna say, I, I support the path, um, Aaron, that you've articulated, except for the fact that I would like that buffer zone um, clearly delineated as part of it. Yep. I agree. I'm in but agreement I, with that. I think that um, the enforcement order as outlined is reasonable with the addition of like as permanent as possible delineation of that 100 foot buffer. Um, but I think that that's proportional to the violation. Um, Larry, did you have another comment or question? No, that was primarily it. I, I did walk the site and so forth. And I'm actually, when I look at some of the drawings that are here, they show the approximate limit of clearing. And I find that questionable because it looked to me like there were trees that were cut down farther down that slope. Any case. Um, and I think that's that's what we're enforcing here. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, Michelle, go ahead. Um, so I totally agree with a delineation somehow of the limit so that future homeowners, it's pretty loud and clear that there's a limit to what they can do. And I'm, I mean, in my tenure here, we've talked about boulders and rebar, but you know, 
maybe a fence isn't too far off in this case. Um, I am concerned that, you know, if there's existing stumps that they'd be tempted to want to remove those um, as landowner. But I guess as far as the order of um, the, um, what we're approving, it, like, yes, native plantings, but I'd like to be a little more specific about that so that it's not, you know, just some low bush blueberries next to some tree stumps. So do we need to be more specific about that right now, or do we get a chance and some control over the restoration plan later? Well, it really depends how long you'd like to carry on the discussion of this particular site. So if you'd like to carry this on for, you know, three or four more meetings and review what they propose and then comment on what they propose and ask for revisions and go through the motions of that, then we can definitely do that. Um, or we could say we want 10 mature, you know, you can say, I want 20 mature trees planted. I want shrubs planted. You know, you can, you can say something. The only caution I would give you is it should be in keeping with what was done. So we shouldn't be asking for, you know, um, a thousand trees to be planted. I don't know exactly. I haven't accounted for every single tree that was cut in the buffer zone, but maybe we should ask for an accounting of that. How many large diameter trees were cut in the buffer and we would like those replaced with some, have some sort of a, um, you know, a definitive, uh, um, accounting and replacement for the trees that were cut. So I think having a metric for that might be a good idea, but I do think that as specific as the commission can be and wants to be, it would be a good idea to spell that out because it's not fair to the applicant to say, come up with a restoration plan and then for the commission to say, oh, that's not enough or that, you know, we need more, you know, we should definitely specify. Yeah, Larry, hold on. The one, I see you. one second. Um, the, oh, yeah, I'm going to underline Aaron's point that you know, this should be a stabilization and restoration to what was there. So we can't turn this into like a multi-aged, um, like ideal habitat for pollinators. Like that's just not um, in equal measure here. So I, I do really like Aaron's idea to have like a solid metric for just for replacing trees cut down, for example. Um, and also like having been to that site, like it might be tricky to get certain natives to grow there. So just a blanket statement um, might not be as helpful to the applicant as something like replace trees that were cut down with similar native species of trees. Um, so, so basically, Jen, just consistent with how we handle all these kinds of hearings. It's just exactly. restoring the land. Exactly. Yep. Very consistent with our usual Protocol. Standard yep. practice. Yeah. Larry, sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to comment that I'm sympathetic with the idea that the response we had from it in a butter saying, you know, they took down trees which sort of shielded them from the railroad tracks. So with the idea of us going back and suggesting planting things to replace the trees that they took out to help the other neighbors shield just the way that property used to do. Yep. We can't require restoration outside of our jurisdiction, just to be very clear about that. Um, 100 feet from the outer extent of the BVW is going to be our limit of what we can require. Now, you could ask the developer to take that into consideration, um, but it's not our jurisdiction. And that was a comment about Zero Kingman um, earlier in the hearing, and we're really talking about Zero Tuckerman and this yeah. is the steep slope that was cut within 100 feet of the of the resource yep. um okay so it sounds like we have consent up oh, andre questions yeah um i'll just uh i'll just second what uh, michelle was saying about the uh the stumps um on on the slope um those stumps should probably remain there i did notice that one uh one root ball had been removed um, it appeared uh, there was one root ball that's sitting on the, I guess, the um, south uh, side of, uh, of the property, and it might have come from right back there. But whatever it is, those roots are going to uh, maintain um, the stability of, that, uh, of the slope going down within the 100 uh, feet. Uh, exactly. buffer zone and maybe, maybe putting in some, uh, some blueberry uh, a series of blueberry bushes uh, 
along there might help to uh, stabilize it. Um, okay, just but, to clarify, there's no knowing where that stump came from, um, but point taken yeah. that um, not removing any of the stumps currently within our jurisdiction within the 100 foot buffer yeah. that were cut um, in violation um, makes a lot of sense. And Aaron, I thought I that was, I have like 700 screens open on my computer, but of I course I had that included. I can pull up. I I would think we would look at the how many trees were removed between the hundred and the one hundred foot and the fifty foot buffer. So there's one other point I would like to make on this discussion, um, and I think it's an important discussion for the commission to consider. Um, I'll just use an example from a previous position that I was in. Um, in a previous job that I was at, um, if there was a slope over a wetland, the commission ex under their local bylaw extended their buffer zone to the top of slope to protect the buffer zone and the resource areas. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because the commission does under our local bylaw have, um, does allow for alteration of up to 35 feet from the BBW. Now, as staff, I recognize the fact that a steep slope very close to a BVW is an extremely, extremely important thing to keep stable. And I've seen it so many times that landowners go in, open up a slope, and then once it's open, that's the end of it. You get rills, you get gullying, you get um, slumping in, down into the wetland. And I've actually seen an entire hillside collapse into a perennial stream from somebody doing that exact thing. Um, I think it's really important for the commission to articulate that in this case, it is an extenuating situation because of the fact that there's a steep slope that is in the buffer and that ordinarily with any permit, we look at it on a case by case basis. So there might be situations where, and I'll use an example, like we just were dealing with um, on 80 Pine Street, they are trying to protect the slope and not do anything in that area so as to minimize any impact to the river. And in this case, it's the same exact situation. So I think we're looking at on a case by case basis, we want to be reasonable, but we also, you know, need to, they, the, the owner and um, folks need to understand that in this particular case, it's a unique situation because it's a steep slope. And so there could be tremendous damage done to the resource if that slope is opened up and so yeah. they could file a permit, they could file an RDA just like they did to open the slope up and do work there. And so um, it would be up to the commission to deny that. And so if we're gonna say you need to replant that slope, um, just to consider that as a precedent that we're setting that slopes over steep wetlands are important resources. And I think the key words from Aaron just said were the biggest, you know, our largest concern here to the resource is failure of that slope. So the goal of the enforcement should be stabilization of the slope. And that should be kind of a reasonable within reason. Um, you know, we can't establish a uh, habitat that wasn't there before. Um, that's doesn't, that seems less reasonable. Um, so yeah, so it seems like we have consensus that no stump removal, but I don't think that was part of the applicant's plan anyway. Um, so we should make that clear in the enforcement order. It seems like we have consensus on some sort of de clear delineation of that 100 foot, the boundary, the 100 foot buffer from the resource. Um, I think where it seems like we're still a little scattered is like how we handle any replanting. I think replanting as many native trees as were cut is reasonable. Um, I don't know that extending far beyond that um, is reasonable in this case, uh, but I will, you know, we can discuss it for a few more minutes. Um, does anyone have, yeah, sorry, did somebody have a comment? No, okay, Andre. Yes, there's, yeah. there's a comment. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, for them to replace uh, with uh, as many trees as um, as they've cut, um, 
though I don't think uh, that it's that they're going to be able to replace them with trees of the same uh, size and age as uh, what they took. Um, so we may need to consider that um, consider uh, a few more or what what other possibilities there are there. And Andre makes a really important point yeah. there that the commission could, if you're requiring trees to be replanted, we should be very specific about what um, our expectations are for trees. So for example, somebody could cut, could plant a seedling, which is, you know, as mm -hmm. high as, you know, three inches high, or they could cut a tree that's six feet high, you know. Um, yeah. I, one question I have there is what's our um, ability to basically monitor the health and growth of these trees. So it's one thing just to plant them and leave them. Um, Jen and Aaron, I'm curious here, because I agree with, with Andre that, um, you know, you plant trees, maybe not all of them survive, you know, it's, it just takes time, but I'm curious, like, what's our, what's our ability to make sure that those trees are cared for, not just planted in? Yeah, usually, um, there's some kind of conditioning for monitoring and sometimes there's conditions for inspections like uh, years or at certain benchmarks after planting. And in that case, um, there would be an expectation that be, there'd be at least 50% mm -hmm. success of the species Great. on the site after a three year period. Great. I was gonna say that's what I've seen is like percent survival after a given amount yeah. of time. I've more frequently seen that in NOI, NOI conditions, like fully yeah. permit conditions and enforcement order conditions. Just um, it's yeah. So Jen, my, to enforce monitoring. Yeah, my my feeling is um, uh, because it's a violation, and you know w whether it's an RDA or an NOI, whatever is um, the strictest in terms of ensuring that the trees grow. You know, like, yeah. So RDA and NOI are not on the table here. Um, those are all permits for the work. This is an enforcement oh, order okay. as a result of the violation. Got it. Got so it. Well, the distinction I was making is that often when you see things like monitoring and percent survival for replantings or plantings or restoration mm -hmm. plantings, it's usually in like a full permit where you're like fully conditioning a permit. Okay. It's something that you're usually tracking with an enforcement order just for- So, we can't, so we can't do that here, basically. We, well, we can. uh, just one, one correction I would just make to what Jen just said is that we could, as a result of this enforcement order, require a notice of intent filing for a restoration plan. That would give us more control, especially particularly with a lot of the issues that you guys are talking about, putting in fencing, requiring you know strict you know accounting of the number of trees, replacement of number of trees, the size of the plantings, um, the, you know, you can ask for something, as you could see in the form, like a restoration plan be submitted by this date, and this is what it must include. It's a pretty short uh, sentence long of expectations, but if we have a longer expectation list of what we want done on that site, you could require a notice of intent to be submitted specifically addressing the restoration and sure. um, stabilization there. That's only if we feel like we can't protect the resource with well, a standard enforcement order. Yeah, I mean, I think that'll be, I mean, I think that's, this is where we need to hear from um, the developer and his consultant, because right now I think because there's been a violation and I haven't seen um, movement to want to sort of correct any of the actions that have been um, taken. Um, so that's, that's my, that's my position. Okay. Um, yeah, just for clarity, you know, I, Larry, I see you, give me a second. Um, just for clarity, so we hadn't, we, you know, the, our first opportunity to ratify that enforcement order, so make it in, put it in effect is tonight. Um, so the restoration plan and the date on the enforcement order for the restoration plan is technically tomorrow. So that hasn't, there's not a problem yet, but the trajectory of the response to this enforcement order, um, just for the record. Yep, that's good, thank you. Um, Larry, go ahead. I'm concerned about the idea that, that we, it, we, we impose something in terms of an enforcement order, but the fact that at, as time goes forward, the developer shifts that to the homeowner and who has responsibility afterwards if they can move that beyond where they have to deal with it? Isn't that when you do an NOI though, doesn't it stay with the home? Um, 
That, that's true, but oh, I mean, it's whoa, also. Whoa, hold on, let's get this. Let's get this straight, Aaron. So if you can you can require an enforcement order to be recorded, in which case that it would actually require um, that it be cleared before the property changes hands. What about but the Larry, your your question is also like a perennial question. It's not one that's like particularly egregious for this site. I mean, that I know, I know, I know. It's that is. something that's like pervasive throughout probably the state of Massachusetts. So I don't know that we're going to solve that with this enforcement. I think we should kind of stick to like, how do we okay. move forward with this enforcement right now? Yeah, Michelle, I'll go ahead. Um, so in just regards to the conditioning of monitoring and um, like success of the plantings, does that go to the homeowner? I mean, because this house is going to get sold as soon as it's built. So who whose responsibility does that move with? So, yeah, I mean, it, the answer is it there's there's so many dependent factors on that question like if we required that the enforcement order be recorded or if we required a notice of intent application to um restore the area per the enforcement order those could be recorded on the deed and it would be made very clear to the person buying the home that there was an encumbrance on the deed that there was some outstanding issue with the property um a lot of mortgage lenders won't allow people to purchase a property when there's an encumbrance on the deed, they want clear title. Um, so it, it really creates a pretty substantial hardship for the folks who um, own the property to restore it and, and um, get it resolved so that um, they can move forward with selling the property and moving on with their lives um, after the property is developed. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, you I can guess. also... Who, yeah, I guess so. So, how long do we monitor the success of the plantings? Is that like a three-year thing? Is it a five-year thing? And does does the homeowner then become responsible if they buy the house with an encumbrance for the monitoring the success of that restoration? I mean, I've seen it with notices of intent that um, that there's a. a condition that the homeowner, if it's an enforcement case, that the homeowner is made aware prior to purchase of the enforcement and the requirements of the enforcement. And they actually have to sign a letter that states they understand there's outstanding enforcement and that they have to continue to monitor and, you know, they're responsible for resolving the situation with the Conservation Commission. So that's, that's, Another requirement, but again, a lot of the specifics that you guys are getting into would be things that would need to be conditioned in an order of conditions and that that's really the tightest way to require all of what you yeah. are explaining. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it would be very atypical that we would do that through an enforcement order and so to say, okay, through this enforcement order, requiring an NOI for an for a restoration plan and then through that NOI permit, that's how we would condition all of this. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's proportional to the goals of what we're talking about with this enforcement, which is stabilizing this slope. I mean, that is the main concern here is cutting into the hundred foot buffer. And, you know, we haven't given, the applicant hasn't responded. We haven't ratified the enforcement order yet. So that we don't have any response from the applicant as to like where we're going to go with this, you know? Um, so I'm, I guess I'm hesitant maybe, to go maybe ahead. Jen, maybe we hear them out and then we wait until tomorrow and make, and then, you know, at our next meeting, we have a more fulsome discussion. Is that the best path? Um, yeah. So that's <laughs> one, we have to ratify some sort of enforcement okay. order tonight to, yeah. in order to have a response. Okay. Okay. But I think that's kind of what Erin outlined when she asked for a restoration plan in this enforcement order. If we ratify it, then in the next meeting, hopefully we'd have some sort of stabilization, restoration plan, slope stabilization plan to review from the applicant. Okay, yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. I would just urge you guys that if you have additional requirements that you want to put on top of the enforcement order I already issued, that you specify those when you ratify the enforcement order. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, it's not fair to the respondent to say, This is what I'm requiring. And then all of a sudden at the next meeting say, sure. Oh, wait, but we want this many more we, items. We can't be a moving target for yeah, that. I understand. that is, yeah, that's not really sure. um, tenable. So after we hear from them, we'll look at what Aaron proposes and modify it. Or do we need to determine that right now? I think we should get pretty close here. Um, and I really, I think based on what Aaron has proposed, the additional thing that we have come, I've kind of come to consensus on is this delineation of the 100 yeah. foot. 
platform. Erin, can you pull up what you proposed again so we can all look at it? And absolutely. So I think while while you're uh, pulling that up, I'll just uh, mention something that was uh, that we were talking about before. I think Jen mentioned. Um, a restoration plan shall be filed with the uh, issuing authority on or before 324. We need to, I think, uh, give a give a better date than that at this point. Yeah. Um, you yes. know what? What would uh, that might be a quick point of discussion? Um, would it be reasonable for uh, to give them two weeks uh, to have it ready before the next? Uh, um, the next meeting or would it what, what would be reasonable for that yeah so our next meeting is on oh it isn't actually we have three weeks until our next meeting so our next meeting is on april 13th because we're on the second and fourth wednesdays um so we actually have a three-week gap here Sounds like, be... like that three weeks yeah i agree with Leroy on that that seems reasonable to me so I'm sorry, what was the date that you guys just mentioned? The next meeting, I think, is April 13th, Aaron. So, um, and just uh, bef before, um, if I could just uh, make a couple suggestions. So rather than April 13th, I would suggest April 8th, because that would give the commission an opportunity to actually review it prior to the meeting instead of getting it at 4.30 uh, the day of. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, if the commission is willing to ratify, I would be really uh, appreciative of, you know, including that date and also whatever additional accounting that we're asking of the applicant, like accounting for the number of trees, accounting for the hundred foot buffer, um, those types of things I think should be incorporated. Yeah. Yep, agreed. So it sounds like the first thing is the date for the filing of the restoration plan in response to this enforcement order would be Friday, April 8th. We can all, I think we're, there's, seems like there's consensus on that. Are we okay with that commission? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then it seems like another factor or request condition is um, delineation of the hundred foot buffer, clear delineation of the 100 foot buffer. Um, you know, we've, we've used boulders before we've used, you know, stakes with birdhouses, we've used rebar, there have always been a lot of different kind of options on the table. Usually that's something that we've discussed with the applicant here, I think we should err towards more permanent um, but I also recognize, you know, it's a building site, so it's going to be tough to have giant boulders there. Um, so do people have any kind of reasonable suggestions for what that delineation would look like? I mean, I like the boulders, but I think we should have a discussion with them about it. Okay. Yeah, that, um, that seems like a good opportunity to hear from the applicant who, Erica, I see that your hand has been raised this whole time. We're getting there. Um, okay, other, so it sounds like we would like an accounting of how many trees were cut within the 100 foot buffer. Um, and what, what's the percentage of trees we want to plant in addition to that, just to right. ensure that? Well, trees and size. I mean, you know, there were yes. some significant trees that were cut down there. Right. Um, I mean, we, aren't, we aren't saying put put back a shrub for a two foot diameter tree. Yeah, trees grow. So it's a question of like, how many more trees then were cut do we feel like we need to ask planted and what size in order to kind of quick as rapidly as possible stabilize that slope. Keep in mind, we're also asking for a silt fence to be installed here. So we're not gonna immediately have, you know, rilling down the slope. Um, what percentage of additional trees is typical, typical gen, like 20, 30%, something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I've really seen it all over the board and it really depends on like where you're planting and what you're planting. Um, Michelle, Andre, what is your, I wish Flesher were here. Hmm. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not very well versed in the, uh, in, in the tree aspect of things. Yeah. 
it's tough. It totally depends on what you're planting and how big they are to start with. Um, okay, what about, go what, ahead. About, what about size? What sort of size trees are we looking for? Yeah, so we'd be like specifying like some sort of caliper tree, essentially. Um, Leroy, any exposure thoughts? I'd like to say anything over two inches at least. Okay, so two inch caliper at minimum. Um, about placement. Hmm. Dispersed, do we need to? Dispersed throughout impacted area. Um, do we want to remove the, like the seed and thing? Because we specifically aren't talking about like reseeding it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should consider seeding it as yeah, well. Yeah, the seed will come in a lot yeah. faster than the trees, and the seed won't outcompete the trees. So, it yeah, can have and an interim solution. We've yeah. lost a lot of big root systems in there, and I know that they're still in place, but um, might provide a little additional stability. As far as number of trees, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't do restoration, but you mentioned a fit, like an assumption of fifty percent mortality. So, is that a number to it seems high. Yeah, maybe, but, I, but, I, but I have no data. Oh, I was also thinking twice the number cut, except if we are going to overseed it with some sort of mix um, that would serve the same function, I'd be all right cutting back to just as many cut or one and a quarter times. I think, I think, yeah, I think just as many cut if we're seeding um, with a native seed mix to let them come in. I mean, these are two inch caliper trees that we're talking about here. So for me, I think that would be reasonable. Um, what else? I'd make sure to include uh, that the uh, stumps remain. Yep. Thanks, Andre. Oh, yeah. I think that's pretty extensive. I think that's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so commission. Um, Aaron, would you mind stopping sharing for one second? Of course, absolutely. Everyone, thanks. <laughs> so this has been a great discussion. Thanks everyone for kind of working through this. Um, the question here is, so uh, Erica Larner, who's the consultant for this, app, for the application that we close, um, has had her hands raised. I think it's up to us whether we um, kind of take openness for public comment. Um, so I want to get a read from everyone on that. I, you know, we can keep, keep it, keep it, you know, orderly and um, kind of give Erica a limited amount of time for questions and comments, but um, it's up to yeah. us if we want to do that. I, my instinct okay. is that to keep the conversation open and keep yeah. it reasonable is a good way forward. I see Erin, maybe I'm. I just want to make one quick point. Um, uh, Pete Wilson, scheduled like two weeks in advance to come to this conservation commission meeting to talk about Carver, um, his site on Carver enforcement that he's been working to resolve and he's yeah. in the audience and he's been waiting for quite a while. So I just wanna make sure that, that the commission is aware of that in terms of time. Yeah, maybe we just make it really succinct. Jen. Yeah, which was my, so you're talking about Cantonav, right, Aaron? Correct. Did, okay. What did I say, Carver? That's okay. Oh Good. I did not know that he was planning to be here. And thank you for telling me. Um, sorry about that. Um, oh, no, it's it's fine. I mean, I there's a lot of members from the public who are interested in this site, but I just want to make sure we're respectful of the fact that he's yeah. on the call as well. Yep. Okay. All right. So it sounds like we have consensus on how we'll specify this enforcement order. We're going to take a brief um, period of public comment. I would ask that public comments stay relevant to the topic at hand, and that is the enforcement order for Zero Tuckerman Lane, specifically protecting the resource via stabilization of a steep slope um, where some trees were cut. Um, and I'm gonna give two minutes um, for kind of introducing yourself and making um, any comments or questions relevant to the topic at hand. Um, so Erica has her hand up. Um, I see you close behind Charlie. 
Eric, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Sorry, there's a delay tonight, folks. There's Erica, I can see you. Hi folks, um, Erica Larner, I'm here representing the, um, the respondent, Dan Lewis, for this potential enforcement order. Um, and, and, and I do apologize because I know the commission just spent a good deal of time on hashing this out. But as Jen mentioned, the goal of this is stabilization. And as Aaron mentioned, we could submit an RDA, which we did do and you folks just approved earlier in this meeting to allow grass seed mix for stabilization in the slope with no stumping. The plan that was approved earlier this meeting specifically listed grass seeding for stabilization in the limit in the limit of, in the area that was cleared without the permit. Um, and so we actually did that exact process, which was submit the RDA and stabilize the slope using grass seeding. Um, so we've actually achieved the enforcement order. We, the, the permit was issued, so the enforcement order wouldn't be valid because the work was already permitted and determined to be non-jurisdictional under the Amherst Wetlands Bylaw. So I'm so sorry, folks, but it, it's you just determined that it was not jurisdictional and it's on the plan that was approved and cited in the motion. Okay, thanks for that comment, Erica. All right. Um, so we'll move forward kind of with our plan for ratifying that enforcement order. I have another um, question or comment. It looks like Charlie. Again, um, relevant to the enforcement order at hand. Uh, oh, okay, here he comes. Yes, hi. Um, I guess just in response to what was just said, the actions that occurred on the slope happened before any of this. And so in my understanding is an enforcement order is about the actions that happened before anything was approved just now. That's one point. The second thing I'm wondering about is who surveys or verifies the 100 foot buffer to make sure that that 100 foot buffer is ac accurate. And then the third, third and fourth point I just want to make is, is one, thank you to the commission and for everyone in this meeting for their efforts on this, it's greatly appreciated. And I just wanna to signal to the developer because we really haven't had an opportunity to talk to him that I hope moving forward, we can establish an open and respectful dialogue should any other issues um, arise. Thank you. Appreciate it, Charlie. Thank you for, for being here and keeping track of this. All right. Um, any other public questions or comments relevant to this enforcement order? Brenda, promoting you to a panelist. Hi, I just had one quick question because the, and I too just echo, we thank the Conservation Commission for all the work that you're doing. We really appreciate it. Um, but the types of trees, I earlier discussion was in terms of hope with, you know, knowledge of what types of trees should be planted. And I just wanted to point out that there were owls and whippoorwills that were living in those trees. Those are mature trees, both oaks, maples, and different kinds of pines. So I'm really concerned about what types of trees would be planted. So I just would like to see some clarification on that. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. All right, members of the public, any, please raise your hand if you have um, questions or comments. All right, um, I do think that was a good point. Um, we had mentioned native trees of minimum two inch caliper, um, but I don't know if we like got that in for sure as consensus on your bullet point notes, Aaron. Um, is that okay? Native trees, mix of native trees, hardwoods and softwoods. Right, or, you know, if you want to replace what's on site, I mean, what was cut, but I, obviously that's difficult to confirm. Yeah. 
I think some of them were hardwoods, some of them were softwoods, some of them would stump sprout, others just won't. Um, it was a real mix. So I think a mix and well dispersed throughout the impacted area, um, especially per Michelle's comment earlier. All right, so I think we have a plan. Sounds like we're in consensus on how to kind of the amend this enforcement order and then ratify it. I'm seeing, I'm not seeing any head shaking or frowns. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go with that. Um, how do you wanna do this, Aaron? Do you want to, go ahead, tell, tell, me, tell me what you want um, to do. I'm just drafting a motion right now. If you guys could just bear with me for three minutes. And if there's any other thoughts while I'm typing, feel free to share. None. Any, uh, any discussion on species? I mean, I saw pines, hemlocks, and, uh, um, and uh, oaks. Uh, yeah, I that, that, looks that were cut there. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of hemlock, especially a lot of hemlock and, and some pine and, and yeah, exactly in bulks. Um, yeah. Should we? Oh, yeah, I was surprised. It must have been some sort of hybrid. I couldn't tell if it was like a red or wouldn't be a white. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, this is just a draft here um, to get us under discussion. So motion to ratify the enforcement order at zero Tuckerman. Um, and I would say to include, uh, well, let me see, zero Tuckerman as drafted to include the following. Um, accounting for the number of trees removed, size, uh, clear delineation of the 100 foot buffer zone in the field with flagging as a temporary measure, but also a permanent measure to be determined. Um, replanting of native mix of hard and softwood dispersed on the site, monitoring for three years with 50% success response. Uh, of restoration plan should be submitted by 4822 and stumps must remain on the site. Just, just trying to clarify, Aaron, maybe where you say um, clear delineation of the 100 foot buffer zone in the field, flagging as temporary measure and permanent measure TBD. Did that get it? Did that capture uh, it? Yep, changed temporarily to temporary. All right, I'll awesome. make a motion. Are we ready? All right. so. A motion to ratify the enforcement order at Zero Tuckerman Lane is drafted to include the following. Accounting for the number of trees removed by size, clear delineation of the 100 foot buffer zone in the field and flagging as temporary and permanent measure to be determined. Replanting of na native mix of hard softwood dispersed on site, monitor for three, three years with 50% success. Response of restoration plan submitted by 4 8 2022. Stumps must remain. Seconded. All right. I have Laura on the motion. Leroy seconded. Voice vote. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Uh, would it be appropriate for me to vote on this one? Yes. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I'm an I. All right. So it sounds like thank you, Aaron, for keeping track of all of that and everyone for your patience to work through that. Um, we have, I think, one more thing on the agenda, and that's um, discussing the enforcement at Camp Nav. Um, yeah. <sighs> So can I, if I could just jump in here. So the, the, there's an outstanding enforcement um, on Canton Ave for work that was done in violation. And um, uh, uh, Pete Wilson um, has worked uh, with, um, I believe Berkshire Design to come up with a plan to 
redesign the site um, to accommodate the wetland, which is expanded as a result of the enforcement on the site. Um, they wanted you to have a look at the plan and there's a couple questions being asked here. So I think, and, and we'll obviously give um, Pete a chance, but it's, um, <laughs> Is the commission willing to lift enforcement? Because at this point, he's um, followed what the enforcement order said, and so he wants to get the enforcement order lifted. The order of conditions is on the verge of expiration. Um, I believe in June it's expiring. So he's coming up on the deadline for when it, it I think it's June 6th, early June, it's expiring, and they need to basically request um, 30 days in advance of that and extension on that permit. That permit, I believe, um, may have, I'm not, I, to be honest with you, I um, it didn't have much time to sort of prepare uh, the old plan to compare to the new plan so that you guys could make a decision. But the ultimate decision that they're looking for here from you is there's a permit that's about, about to expire for a subdivision that had a violation. The violation has been resolved, but the site conditions have changed. And something needs to happen in order to approve the modification to the lot. Um, and the modification is significant enough that it's not a minor change at this point. So do, do, is the commission interested in having an amended order of conditions on an existing permit where plans have been vetted and we're looking at a change to one of the lots? Or are we looking for a new permit filing? And I don't think that that decision needs to be made tonight, I think. Um, but it starts the dialogue. And um, I just wanted to preface with that so that you guys had some background because for Michelle and Andre, it's a new situation and um, keep it moving <laughs> quickly. And just to clarify, so Aaron, we would be like going through all this effort to amend a current order of conditions for it to then expire in June, right? So could we extend the permit through that amendment or? Well, is it so I'm not talking about a minor administrative change here. I'm talking right. about a formal amendment, which would require yeah. notifi notification of a butters, posting of a legal ad, holding a hearing to review the permit, in which case a new order of conditions would be issued and there would be a new deadline to the permit. It's really a matter of, do we want to keep carrying forward an old permit at this point, or do we want to start with a clean slate on the permit? For the applicant, the lift is pretty much the same. <laughs> Um, I mean, that is my understanding pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you're still going through the whole hearing process review process. Um, it, it's a existing DEP number versus a, um, I think the filing fee would, might be the only distinction between the two. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. So relevant to this enforcement order, what should we Pete well so so Pete is here um and he wanted yeah. to to talk to you about this so I wanted to give okay. him you know give him a fair yeah. chance to speak since he okay. has been waiting okay all right um so it says Patrice Wilson but it's because by Pete Mr I guess Mr Wilson uh um, go ahead yeah he just maybe uh signed in with somebody else's account maybe okay. I'm not sure um if you're here to kind of talk with the commission about the outstanding enforcement or zero can't nav and amr so if you could raise your hand and i'll move you in as a panelist okay uh okay here we go really slow tonight says that it's, oh, sorry, it's moving at about the same speed as my brain. All right, one more try. There we go. Pete, is that you? You're muted. Looks like you're still muted on your end.
Oh, unmuted. Say something. There, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Sorry about that. I'm not great with technology. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Sorry tonight. I was trying to have Tom here and Ward, who's our soils guy, both had prior commitments, uh, unfortunately, come up. So Aaron laid it out, the question, um, we'd like to get the enforcement order lifted. You know, I have said this to Aaron in email. Um, the original owner of this lot had uh, put a um, just a house uh, site in originally to do the Wetlands Act or to do the Wetlands Permit. We have just refined it a little bit to include what we would like to build there. Um, everything that's there is just a little in a little different space, a little different place, but it's all the same as originally was approved. Just moved around a little bit. You can see the rain garden has shifted a little bit. The house and garage are now attached versus originally was a house and a detached garage. And you know, my feeling is is um, it would be the simplest if the commission would extend the existing permit. Everything, nothing else has changed out there, and we could get underway building here, perhaps even as early as uh, later so, this fall. Sorry, so Aaron, is the delineation the same as it was when we first permitted the? project yeah so i think there's been a change to the resource delineation which is our jurisdiction which is our real interest in this project um yeah so uh so the only thing that's changed is as aaron had mentioned and you can see on the plan there was some additional wetland which is what moved the rain garden uh, from its original location. Um, but that's the only change. Everything else has stayed the same. Sorry, my I'm just trying to pull up the plan, Aaron. Yeah, I'm working, I'm working on okay. uh, yeah. on both Sorry. here. So I apologize. It just we're takes me a little while to queue everything up. Um, yeah, we're both just trying to um, switch gears and pull up your plan so we can have it in front of us. Okay, so um, this is the original approved site. I'm gonna share my screen. Hold on, hold on. Let me just queue up both the plans really quickly. <clears throat> okay. This is the original approved lot right here. And let me just bear with me for a second. Um, this is the original approved resource area boundary. Approximately, I'm, you know, trying here to just give you a general sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got to clear these so you can see the other page. So my bear with me. And this is the new one and it's at a different orientation. So like I can turn it to make it a little bit more apples to apples. Um, let's see, does that work? Oh, it's, it, it, the orientation of the plan is a little different. So I'm not sure what is easiest for you guys as far as viewing. And, uh, sorry. Oh, so I'm very sorry, but I clicked something and now it's not letting me move it. Oh, okay, I can't, I can't rotate it now for some reason. Oh, here we go. I don't know why it's not letting me rotate. That's weird. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, here we go. There we go. So um, just looking at the old one, the wetland was located here. There was a stormwater basin. There was a uh, garage, a house, and there was a driveway access coming in here. And then looking at the proposed new, um, it's driveway locations changed, house locations changed, garage locations changed. This is a, I mean, I've, it's upside down at this point. I'm just trying to give you guys some level of, um, you know, this is the um, 
rain garden. Rain garden. Um, so previously there was a uh, little rain garden proposed here, and now the rain garden has been relocated. Um, so show us the delineation on the yeah. new plan. Um, new plan, the delineation. So part of the issue was that the wetland expanded um, like out here before the wetland was, um, it kind of came up like this, but with the work that was done, the wetland expanded into that green area, the wetland expanded into green area. The, the other thing to tell you is the driveway is the same. The only thing was Bucky Sparkle was the original um, civil who drew, who drew the first plan and his skit, we, we tried every which way to work with him, but he's a one, you know, one uh, person in the office and projects were, other projects were expanding. And so his timetable was rapidly just pushing back on us. So we ended up, uh, he recommended um, Berkshire. So we moved to Berkshire. So Berkshire's kind of heavily highlighted the driveway, but the driveway runs exactly as it did originally. Um, it's the only thing I think that Aaron had mentioned that wasn't oh. actually. Now the garage is attached. And, and now the garage is attached. The house, the house and garage run parallel to the rear uh, property line. The original house was tilted as you see at an angle. Okay, so I guess an issue here, commissioners, is how we feel about the fact that that there's like a the the wetland has extended. I'm totally confused about <laughs> cardinal directions here, but to the right of the screen that we're currently looking at, into where the former rain garden was, but so it's kind of running along the driveway, and the rain garden has been moved down. Um, I'm going to spin it around so that it's a little bit better and you can actually sorry, read it. that wasn't uh, like, yeah, it, you. it was my own oh, confusion. Oh, it, no, and it's, it's see, because the plan, the way that it opened, um, it was, and, and also because there, the existing plan is oriented exactly opposite of the proposed of plan. Yeah, so. no, nobody's fault. It's just like, that's what happens. Um, so commissioners, the question is, are we need to can't do we feel like we can amend the current permit sufficiently to accommodate to condition and accommodate that change in the resource or do we think a new fi permit filing is appropriate here given the change in the resource does anyone have any clarifying questions for pete or aaron Aaron, Aaron has a clarifying question for Aaron. Well, it just calls to question this permit was when this permit was originally applied for. And, um, you know, this was from 2017. And, you know, we're making a lot of assumptions guiding the applicant right now as far as the existing site conditions. Like the wetland could have expanded on the second lot that's associated with this project. Like there could have been change in the wetland layout in the lot that's in the other location. And we're by saying amend this permit for this specific lot, we're assuming all the site conditions are the same on the other lot. Um, so I just wanna point that out because, yeah. you know. Okay, so given that this isn't a public hearing, um, Pete, I'm just gonna ask if you have any more comments or updates for us um, and then probably move you out um, of the panel so we can have a discussion as a commission. Um, do you have any more kind of clarifying comments or information for us? I don't. Okay, we appreciate you being here and um, go ahead, Aaron. Thank you, Pete, for- Yeah, and I was just gonna Working say, with us and yeah. being kind, we very much appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise, thank you. And I realize that this is late. Um, so thanks for hanging with it. Um, and we'll do our best to get our heads around this and figure out the kind of most efficient way forward in a way that meets, you know, kind of our regulatory requirements. Um, 
we'll do our best to, to get through this as, as efficiently as possible. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Another option here too, Jen, is for us to think about this. We don't have to make a decision on the spot right this moment. Um, I think it's a, it's a point of discussion. And I think also Fletcher, who was involved with this original permit filing, could definitely, his involvement, I think, would be really valuable on this. Yeah, so I wasn't even, the original permit filing is before my time on the commission. Um, so it would be helpful to have Fletcher. So how does that work, though, keeping in mind that Pete is trying to figure out how to move forward here. Um, well, we have time to issue an extension. Um, okay. It's it's only March. I think he's got a little time. And you know, right. if in three weeks we decide that you know we're going to issue, we could issue an extension at that point if we felt right. like we were coming up against a deadline for um, expiration. But um, right. I'm, I would like to put some thought to this, and you know, it could be resolved with something as simple as a site visit. Um, so yeah. So let's think about it. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. I think some information gather, gathering. I personally would like to be able to go back out there. I think having Fletcher here, who is here during the, is familiar with the site and is familiar with the whole kind of like arc of this project, would be very helpful. I think it would ultimately benefit both the efficiency of the application and protecting the resource. Um, so that's my my instinct on this. I'm also admittedly a little bit fried and it's quarter of 10. Um, so I know that we've all had to have a, a long span of attention to a lot of detail here. And I, Pete, I just wanna give it a fair a fair look um, before we make any decisions. Is that okay, commissioners? But we appreciate the fact that you have worked so hard to yeah. satisfy. And I you know, I think that we're, we're at this point from the way I see it that, that Pete is in compliance at this point because he has satisfied the requirements that were asked of him in the enforcement order. I don't know if anyone feels otherwise, but. Um, no, I think we're in compliance. We just need, I just wanna give it the fair, fair chance to get all the information possible so that we can kind of make a decision efficiently in the next meeting. Um, yeah, and I would just echo everything Aaron just said. Um, thank you for the cooperation, Pete. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, those plans look like they have all the information that we need. Um, I think a site visit and making sure Fletcher weigh in is worth it. Commissioners, seems I got a thumbs up from Larry. Oh, Lori too, okay, okay. So we'll keep moving on that at the next here, next meeting. That would be on April 13th. All right. I think that was the last agenda item, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. Is that, never mind. We don't have to continue that, right? Because it's not open. No, we don't have to continue anything. I think as long as we know it's going to be on the next agenda for a discussion point. Yep. Okay. So I think we just need a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. <laughs> All right. I second that. All right. <laughs> Voice vote. Michelle. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Sec. Yep. Andre. Aye. <laughs> Laura. Aye. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, guys. Good Bye. job, guys. Thanks Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Aaron. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys.